The attack vector a piece of malware uses is usually said to exploit either a hardware or software vulnerability or a human because humans are often the weak spot in a system. Nowadays, hardware and software is tested so extensively and a lot of software in particular is open source and people spot mistakes and security weaknesses very quickly, but humans are quite gullible and can be easily tricked and this process is called social engineering. From the perspective of a software developer, when you find a vulnerability in your code, like a bug or a mistake or someone's left in a backdoor, someone's done something malicious, you need to issue a patch to address this software vulnerability. And often as attackers, an attack vector is to target unpatched software. So as soon as a patch is released, that's a giveaway that there's been a security flaw. And it's going to be quite clear that not everyone's going to update their software automatically. You, some people don't ever update their operating system or any of their software. So someone can view that security patch and try and work out what the issue was and then target any software which hasn't been updated. So that means as a user we must update frequently and of course as a developer we have to fix issues as soon as they occur. To give a real life example of this, another ransomware example in fact, so you can tell I'm quite interested in ransomware, mostly because a few years ago I hadn't really heard of it and it's suddenly become a lot more common. So WannaCry affected lots of countries in 2017, including the NHS in England, probably most famously to us. So it used a software vulnerability in a Microsoft Windows protocol and it was the code name for the uh, vulnerability was Eternal Blue and it was found by the NSA in America interestingly and somehow leaked to a hacker group. As soon as it was leaked Microsoft issued a patch to fix it but not everyone immediately updated their software or even had new enough software so initially the older software like Microsoft XP uh, didn't have this patch applied to it because it was out of date. In this case, the majority of people who got infected were running Windows 7, so relatively new software, so it wasn't that it was really old, they just hadn't updated it. And the people who created this, uh, thought to be from North Korea actually, correctly assumed that not many people would update, and they packaged this into a worm and it spread very rapidly and was very effective until a kill switch was activated. Generally speaking, as a software developer, you should be programming defensively, and that means you are expecting people to misuse and even attack your system. Defensive programming means you validate all inputs, you sanitize inputs to make sure they're not forming an injection attack, you keep data secure, you keep it separate from the main part of the program, uh, and so on. So you're, you're really trying to make things as secure as possible. And of course you should be testing very thoroughly, and this includes both unit and integration tests. Most software is written by multiple people, and so you can test a unit that you've written, and you test it very thoroughly using data which is unexpected so you pose as an attacker and deliberately try and target your system and you also will perform integration tests where you put these individual modules, modules together and test it from a more sort of holistic way. Code quality is really important for security. Two people can create exactly the same program but one of them can code in a much better way and it will be much more secure. There are lots of things you could talk about regarding code quality, even things like logic errors which may not be discovered through the testing process. But what I want to pick up on is the fact that code is often used, is reused frequently. So programmers are quite lazy. If someone else has already programmed something, they'll just try and copy it from Stack Overflow or from a repository like GitHub or from a library. And that means any vulnerabilities in that copied code will just be replicated and spread. So GitHub is what I like to look at first when I am about to do a project just to see if anyone else is doing it. So people will upload their projects to GitHub and you can have a look at them and see how they've done their work and you could just copy it if they're given the correct license. So early in 2018 GitHub introduced a really cool security tool which basically actively looked for vulnerabilities in code uploaded to its website and they found over 4 million vulnerabilities in over 500,000 repositories and any of those a programmer could have copied and put in their own work and of course that vulnerability would be copied across and that was only for Ruby and JavaScript. It means a programmer being lazy or quote unquote more efficient by copying code could quite easily just copy across a vulnerability too and cause a major security issue down the line. So if it takes more time it might be worth rewriting code to ensure that it is secure and doesn't have any vulnerabilities. So that's what's talking about the technical vulnerabilities. Let's just talk quickly about the social engineering aspect of malware. So as we said, social engineering exploits the fact that humans are often the weak points in systems. So you manipulate the humans directly to gain access or give information. So phishing is a very common example of this. This is obtaining sensitive information by disguising a message as coming from a trustworthy source. 
and it's a very common attack vector. So it's, it's possible that WannaCry was introduced to the NHS via an email attachment. You're never going to be able to totally eradicate all social engineering attacks because humans are humans. But some things you can do, like uh, employing very strict filters on emails, like with spam, you can employ filters to try and prevent phishing emails from being shown up in inboxes. You can train employees to tell them about this, show them methods to detect if an email is from a, a fake source or a website is not is not real. Maybe you look at whether it's running a a secure protocol or if it's got a certificate things like that also ensure people have strong access rights so that someone who's a low-level employee hasn't got access to sensitive data which if they install malware on their system is not going to affect other parts of the system if they only have low permissions as well as actually encrypting the data itself so spyware can read it to reduce the effect of spyware and keyloggers in particular Making people change their passwords often is important, say once a week, it will less of an impact the password has if it gets leaked. Also making sure there's multi-factor authentication to sign in, so you're not just signing in with your password, you're signing in with some security question, or maybe also some biometric identification, like a fingerprint or an iris scanner if that's at all possible. So some biometric meaning to do with your, your body, so fingerprint, iris, uh, palm print I think sometimes. Both sorts of things can be used and this obviously reduces the effect of someone reading your password because not only your password is going to be able to gain access to your login. This is like a industrial fingerprint scanner but you have them built into, into lots of phones now as well as facial recognition so it can be used by people to increase their security. Despite all of this, definitely the first protective measure you enact is installing antivirus software or anti-malware software because antivirus software is the name but it's not just protecting against viruses, it's protecting against all the types of malware we've looked at. So just to look at a few ways these work, most of which will maintain a database of known malware and what they'll do is they'll to get the information from malware, they'll extract a signature. We've talked about signatures in the certificates video to do with encryption but just a signature is like a unique identifier for a file and it can compare the signature extracted from files on your computer to that in the database and of course if it matches up with known malware they can then delete that malware before it has an effect. Others will use something called a sandbox which is a virtual environment, a virtual machine in other words where you can run the malware in a safe environment. A virtual machine is mimicking a real computer but actually is controlled by the anti-malware software so it can close it at any time it's not got any access to any real data but if it runs a program it can monitor its behavior in a safe environment where it won't impact the rest of a computer if it determines that this file is not doing anything harmful then they can transfer it out of the sandbox into the main computer otherwise they can delete it so here it's it's found a suspicious file and it's moved it automatically into the sandbox so you can run it in the sandbox to see if it's doing anything dodgy if it isn't you can of course move it back again others will offer what's known as real-time protection which is where everything in the memory is checked so when you open a program it gets loaded into the memory into the RAM and the anti malware will check it from there to see what it's doing and to obviously then quarantine it put it in the sandbox if it's doing something suspicious these are just free methods which are commonly used and of course there are loads, especially in the more expensive versions. But generally if you're cautious and are wary of the social engineering aspect of malware, you'll be fine with the free stuff you can get.